Um, I've been told that I have 50 minutes, so I'm going to take about that much time and then another 50 minutes for question and answers because right. you have nothing to do on a Saturday <laughs> afternoon, right? Sunday. I'm sorry, Sunday yeah. afternoon. Yeah. That tells you already where I'm at. Started <laughs> yesterday. Are you ahead uh, or behind? <laughs> I don't know. I'm trying to figure no, it out. No, but I mean, you're saying Saturday. Yeah. Is it yeah. Yeah. Saturday or yeah. next yeah. Saturday? Thank you. That's very optimistic of you. Um, first and foremost, I am very uh, appreciative of uh, your invitation to speak before you. I never turned down any Rotary Club that asked me to join them because uh, Rotary, and to be quite honest with you, most of all the other service clubs um, have a very special place in my heart. I've worked with Rotary, Kiwanis, Lions, uh, various service clubs at every point of my uh, governmental uh, uh, career, whether as a young deputy to uh, field representative to Congressman Brad Sherman or in Tom Labonja's office or even at the Trade and Commerce Agency in Sacramento. Um, one thing that I haven't heard today and given all the programs you talked about is your book drive. Um, I don't, I, maybe, maybe, I, maybe I'm not aware of some changes, but something that I remember uh, working with various Rotary Clubs in the past would be uh, partnering up and collecting 200 books for a local school library. And so I've actually asked my staff to make sure that they're reaching out to all their local uh, Rotarian, Rotarians at Rotary Clubs to make sure that we're partnering up and doing that through our office as well. And anytime you have a program that you'd like to highlight, especially when it comes to the Rotaract or uh, the youth programs, um, please don't hesitate to use my office as a vehicle of communication and getting the word out. It's, yes. We'll pick you up on that. Thank you. Please do. I have a, I post a good Facebook and email distribution list, so I'm happy to get it out, and I'm very sincere about it. Um, um, part, part of my affinity also with Rotary grew out of uh, being invited on a couple of occasions, and I finally accepted an offer and, and, and applied to a program. But I went to the GSC program uh, to Brazil. And I was in the state of Paraná mm -hmm. through uh, District 5280. And uh, it was a phenomenal experience. We spent, uh, uh, Paraná is uh, primarily agricultural, so we spent about a month visiting about five or six different cities and staying with families. Uh, anywhere from two to four nights with each family. And uh, uh, we were in cities that were as small as 40,000 to 50,000. Um, and it was amazing just to see the life, uh, and especially what a role Rotary played in some of these countries and rural setting areas. Um, you know, it's almost like a... Uh, cult in any way, but it was <laughs> it was it, it was amazing the following that these individuals showed and the respect they demonstrated towards the institution. Um, uh, and it's funny because we will take it so easy and relax and humor one another at meetings like this, but it just seemed to be so serious. And the folks that were involved with it were the local bankers or local elected officials, or so there was a certain prestige to be involved with, uh, with the Rotary, and there was great pride taken. So um, that's, that's my interaction with Rotary. I wanted to just take a moment and uh, tell you a little bit about the state of what's going on in California. Uh, I, I can talk about specific issues if you care to ask questions, uh, and I know that we're Rotary is a non-partisan partisan organization. So what I want to what I want to focus on is the historical change that's going on right now in California, and uh, give you a little bit of my perspective because I kind of enjoy the fact that I've been a student of politics and government, especially living in a very interesting time in California. I mean, we've reaped the my generation has reaped the benefits of being able to come in at the end of what was the wonder years in California when we had the best schools and the best universities, best research, and everything was the best then. We were the envy of the world and people were coming here from all over the world to try to take advantage, all over the country even, to take advantage of the services and the programs that we had to offer. And just within my lifetime, all of that 
went out the window. Um, you know, when I was in college 20 years ago, I could afford working part-time, uh, getting some kind of a tuition assistance program from the place I worked. Usually I would choose to work in banks that offered a tuition assistance program so that I could uh, cover at least some portion of my college tuition and not be too much of a burden for my parents. So, uh, you know, and, and I actually made it work. I paid off my tuition. I would. I only took a loan out one quarter at UCLA. The rest of the time, I uh, basically paid everything and myself and you know, was able to get on my business. You know, 20 years later, that is impossible. In fact, by the time my kids are going to college, um, uh, if, we don't do, if we don't take concrete steps right now as a state, we're not gonna be able to continue, forget continuing, uh, try to come close to offering the promise that California had made starting in the 50s and 60s when we were the envy of our neighboring states and uh, the world at that time. Uh, given the uh, institutions, educational institutions we had, what we offered, and just the economic engine those institutions also provided. Right now, UCLA, uh, the best university in town, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I gotta admit one thing. I went to preschool at UCLA. I went to graduate school at UCLA. And my whole family went to UCLA. So I'm not anti-UCLA, except for if they're playing USB. Because that's where I went to undergraduate. <laughs> Just on that point. Wait a minute. On behalf of my son, who's a matador, <laughs> uh, don't matador forget well. right down the road over here. I, I went to preschool there, too. <laughs> not talking about preschool. <laughs> a, a, go Yale, and B, a grin, the floor is yours. <laughs> Just so you know about my background, I, so I started at Cal State Northridge because I thought I wanted to be a a computer scientist or a mathematician of sorts. That's the only thing I was good at. Um, and uh, and so I thought, well, what can I apply calculus to uh, in life? It wasn't much of a choice. I, I was either going to be a teacher or an actuary. Uh, those were <laughs> my two choices from a college counselor. Um, and then, yeah, I, I always liked uh, economics, the one semester I had of economics in high school. So I thought, why not take uh, macroeconomics class and see how it goes. So I realized I could need to take the microeconomics, then I took the macroeconomics, loved it. And so at some point when I saw that computer science was just not working out, I decided to change my major and go into economics because you can actually also apply math quite a bit to try to explain uh, 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 life tendencies that economists always try to explain. But we always get it wrong, of course, because 20 years later, we realize that everything about the assumptions were completely off. So, but it just makes a great conversation piece to say that you, know, you have an economics degree and talk about things that you know in 20 years are all going to be proven to be false. Um, so, what was that? I'm sorry. If you want to be encouraging about it in some way. Um, um, so, so we, um, so anyway, so back, going back to college, just so you know, I started at Cal State Northridge, couldn't get the classes that I wanted, uh, so I decided to take some classes at Pierce College just to get my GE coursework out of the way and then go continue at, uh, become a Matador at some point, a Matador alumni, but along the way, my girlfriend at the time, who was a UCLA student, said, well, why don't you just come and join at UCLA? So I did and uh, ended up uh, graduating from UCLA, which now looking back gives me a unique perspective of all three institutions well, that yeah. the state has to, has to offer. Yeah. So I'm actually very thankful for that. Um, so let me, let me also say how much I applaud everyone who is actively engaged, is civically oriented, and votes. Thanks to all of you, uh, California has taken great state steps to improve. It's primarily because of three different measures that you all had the opportunity to vote on. I can't even remember some of the proposition numbers, but the first proposition was the change in the budget. In 2010, we all voted to change the budget from a supermajority requirement to a simple majority requirement, barring fees and taxes. That still requires a supermajority vote. 
But what you did, essentially, is make the budget not a sticking point. Mm -hmm. So the budget can pass and work can continue. And it doesn't force a very small minority fraction, minority party, whether Democrat or Republican, it doesn't really matter. Because I think if Democrats had it at some point, they may use that as a filibuster move. But the fact that the budget can continue and employees not be displaced and services not to be displaced and uh, service recipients, folks who depend on uh, uh, disability programs and other life essential programs to not be hindered by the stoppage of state function. Uh, that's key. Uh, and, and, and as you recall, I mean, I don't need to tell you, but in 2008, 2009, 2010, as the state uh, the economy was worsening, you saw the budget become a bigger issue and we're trying to, think, to figure out how to address the state budget. Uh, politics would take over and arguments would start over, well, if we can hold out, we can get something that we want. And everyone would lose perspective that, wait a second, we're talking about a $25 billion budget deficit, a budget hold. And so many services that we fought so hard for are going to be cut, and yet it didn't stop some folks from util utilizing the opportunity to play politics. So thank you for allowing that to not be a sticking point anymore. The state has become much more functional because of that. And even though my colleagues and I take credit for doing working on a great budget, the reality is because of your vote, you've made it into a majority vote, which now is much easier to pass on time. So that's one. Two, uh, in 2012, June primary, when I won my first election, a measure also passed that allows elected officials in the Assembly and Senate to serve more than their uh, truncated period up to a, a total and cumulative 12 years. So what was it, what was the situation up until then was if you got elected to the State Assembly, you could serve up to three terms, two years each term, maximum of six years or up to about six years, unless if there's a special election standard, then it would turn into maybe seven years or so. But si six years, three terms. And in the Senate, it would be two terms, four years each, so a total of about eight years. And then what you would do is first run for the assembly, smaller geographic area, get elected, and then you would start competing for the Senate so that you have an opportunity of serving for a full 14 years. But what that made California politics become, in politics as you can imagine, is already a very competitive environment, attracting type A personality folks. Now imagine if you tell someone that you have, you know, you don't have this much of a time anymore, you have this much, and oh, you need to take out your neighbor right next to you in order <coughs> to succeed in that. Guess what it did? I mean, no one was focused on governance anymore. It was about the next election. So even though we were thinking as, as, as a state that term limits would bring fresh blood, what it actually did was it made the leadership and the principals who made decisions hyper-competitive and never really mindful of long-term governance, but always needing to focus on local elections to make sure that they're staying in power. And then finally, when they got into the state senate, then maybe some good things would come out. And so the state senate was in, the, in that period of term limits, the place where a lot of the more long-term thinking policy work was gonna happen. Um, all of that has now changed. There's a calm, there's a restoration of being able to think out loud and think through things. There's a, an opportunity to say no more, because before no one wanted to say no. Everyone wanted to say yes, because you don't want to upset anyone, because if you upset someone, then that potentially marginalizes your ability to run as an assembly member for the state senate and win. Um, the other thing it did is just structurally, you know, business would come and let's say talk to the principals in government and try to do things, or constituent organizations. Well, you come and try to work with someone, your principal leaders at the elected level, one year. The next year when you come back, it's already somebody else. So there was no continuity of leadership. There was no ability to continue the work that you started and be able to say, 
but what are the next steps that we need to take in order to be able to fix or address long-term concerns? Um, uh, that also requires for those that are getting elected into elected positions to actually come in knowing so much about state government so that they can hit the ground running. Well, that wasn't always the case. You had folks coming in from all backgrounds, and th while there's nothing wrong with that, it's always important to have fresh blood, but what you don't want is half of the institution, 42 out of 80, which was my class coming into office, being fresh blood, because half of the institution needs to rely on who? Experienced staff, unless if they're experienced themselves. So who became powerful all of a sudden? The staff who would stay in Sacramento and who are not elected, they're selected. They're selected by the members. They're not elected. And selecting those staff comes with an agenda item. Maybe you'll select staff because of a specific policy area, not a general area. Maybe you select staff because of cer certain level of comfort you have, or whatever the reasons may be. Um, and the other group that became very powerful were the lobbyists. Uh, because as elected officials came and went, lobbyists always stayed. And they got into a place where they um, knew enough about the circumstances, just like veteran staffers, who would then help guide and win over the trust of elected officials so that they can tell them what's going on. I mean, by the way, one of the best things, you I mean, lobbyists have a very negative connotation. Um, but the reality also is there's much to be learned by some lobbyists who have dedicated their lives on being very knowledgeable about specific issue areas. For example, certain lobbyists who have just worked in healthcare area or water uh, are so well versed on those issues that you do want to spend the time understanding the chronology of why it is that we came to be at the place that we are right now. So there are certain benefits that you derive out of talking to as many individuals as you can, including amongst them, folks that we usually have a negative connotation about. But uh, um, uh, you know, let me not expand too much on this part. I can talk about the benefits of having longer terms and being able to serve a longer period and carrying out a greater vision. But the third thing was that even at the time of the most at the worst economic recession that the state has faced, the nation has faced since the Great Depression, Californians were willing to go out and vote to tax themselves uh, through Proposition 30 to make sure that six billion uh, vital dollars were uh, 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 approved and administered towards the benefit of uh, education. Uh, that was an extremely big deal because the timing of it couldn't be worse. And uh, it's not a bond, it's a self-tax. So uh, one of the issues with that is going to be we're going to need to figure out once those five years are done, how to be able to cover that gap that's going to be coming about. And that's not just one gap. We're also going to be dealing with the gap of the Affordable Care Act, which the federal government right now is paying 100% for, but within five years, with a, de with a gradual decrease of 2% point each year, uh, at the end of five years, we're going to be responsible as a state for 10% of the ACA cost to the state. And the federal government is going to be paying the rest of the 90%. So a lot of the conversations that you're going to be hearing in government right now, and have been hearing for a while and will continue hearing for the next few years, I think the next four years are going to be critical times. Um, I'll tell you that in a second. But, but the, what you're going to be hearing a lot about is how do we come up with uh, <coughs> revenue streams that are not going to just be based on market fluctuations or be hindered by the market fluctuations that force California to make cuts during the down years and boom during the boom years we hire rapidly and start spending on certain programs that you know then become vulnerable again when we go through the the, the thoroughs of the uh, of the economic cycle so that's one, but the other thing is, going back to what I was saying about the next four years being the critical time, is we're working with a governor that uh, I, I, I feel extremely uh, privileged and, and uh, honored to be serving with. This is a man who uh, has had his family, uh, his family's name in California politics, 
and has helped build the infrastructure of our state. And what I generally look for are folks to serve who are not going to use their political position for something else. Uh, and this is a man who I think is going to enjoy the later part of his life once he's done serving the next four years without possibly trying to run for something else. So you know the decisions he's making is not geared towards anything else. And that's of great value to me because I know for the next four years he will need to say no to whatever he doesn't want and be very focused on accomplishing what he wants to do, which is going to be making sure that we have the structural bones in place for California so that we have a long-term sustainable future. And the long-term bones are going to be based on how we treat uh, uh, our constituencies when it comes to the business climate as well as tax revenue streams and getting that careful balance so that California remains a competitive place to bring business in while at the same time not giving the store away to business and making sure that worker protections are in place um, and our middle class continues to grow because our middle class is eroding severely. But enough of those. Uh, if you have any questions, I am happy to address them.